Our fifth lecture concerns the significant biblical figure of Jacob, whose name ultimately changes to Israel. So with this change of name, we get a sense of just how important Jacob is. We closed our Abraham set of stories, or the Abraham cycle, by um, realizing the development of the character of Abraham. Yet, we said that Abraham was always an exemplary character, but during his journey of faith, he continued to grow in faith. The end of the Abraham cycle is marked by a genealogy, as was the beginning of the Abraham cycle. So it was clearly set off, and the same will be the case for the Jacob cycle. The beginning of it is marked by a genealogy in chapter 25, and the end of it is marked by a genealogy in chapter 36. With Jacob, we find a much more unusual figure. Um, he, he does not begin as an exemplary figure by any stretch of the imagination. Jacob is often thought of as the trickster. Um, Jacob does not place his trust in God. Rather, Jacob makes things happen in his life. And if that is through deception, so be it, as Jacob forces his way um, to the top. The stories then have some overlapping elements which bind the two. That is the stories of Jacob and Abraham. Perhaps the most significant overlapping element is Rebecca, the wife of Isaac. Isaac, um, or actually Abraham, sent his servant, probably Eliezer, up to Haran in Mesopotamia to find a wife for Isaac. And Rebekah came down and accordingly married Isaac. But with that, we find the introduction of an Aramean flavor into our stories. And that has been missing from now. In that word, Aramean is a very um, telling word. We see in, um, Moses, in Moses' story, in the book of Deuteronomy, that some of the initial statements, faith statements of Israel, will describe their founders as wandering Arameans. And so with Rebekah, this comes into full play. And we find Rebekah to be a very forceful personality someone who experiences direct revelations from God, and that person that ends up binding these two stories together. So, in turn, then we turn to the story of Jacob. From the very beginning, in chapter 26, <coughs> we find that, um, excuse me, in chapter 25, we find that Jacob's life is a life of striving. He is not the firstborn. That honor goes to his brother Esau, his twin brother Esau. But we hear in this story that they are struggling in the womb. So struggle is going to be a significant part of um, Jacob's story. And then we quickly find another story where, where Jacob is struggling as a young man with Esau. And so we see that as a young man, Jacob wants Esau's place. And Esau is a very colorful and an important figure in his own right, ultimately leading to the nation of Edom. And in these stories of Jacob and Esau, at times we're hearing stories of individuals, but at other times, and perhaps most particularly in chapter 25, we're hearing the story of a nation. And we see that, e that Esau is someone in competition with Jacob. Or we could think of Esau as an Edomite in competition with Jacob as an Israelite. And we get the sense of this emerging nation of Israel and who is pushing aside the Edomite nation. And so, as Jacob steals the birthright of Edom, 
um, through a bowl of lentil soup, a red soup, which reminds us of the Edomite countryside, which in the very south of Jordan is a, a blazing red landscape, not unlike um, southern Utah or the Grand Canyon in our own country of the United States. So we see then that this birthright is stolen for a cup of lentil soup. Esau is very hungry, he needs to survive, and Jacob is able to take advantage of that situation. So in turn, Jacob gets the birthright from Esau. Esau doesn't seem to care. And this will characterize Jacob, who is perhaps maybe the first Israelite, and as a kind of smart and leader of flocks and someone who is willing to push aside a less smart, less wily um, person in terms of Esau, a hunter um, rather than someone with a more um, stable profession. So we see then that difference between the two of them and ultimately that difference in national characteristics and um, according to the biblical writers. So with that then, we'll see that Jacob keeps on pushing. And so it's not enough that he gets the birthright of, of Esau through this um, lentil soup, but now he also wants his father's blessing. And this blessing comes to really characterize this entire Jacob cycle. If we could characterize the Abraham cycle, we could think of promise, of covenant. But in this cycle, we're focused on blessing. And the blessing of the Father is everything, because blessing truly is destiny when it comes to these young men. The blessing that the firstborn receives is a blessing that will allow him to really accede or ascend above those around him. And so we see that Jacob and very much his mother Rebecca are focused on getting that blessing. And in chapter 27, where we focus on that blessing, we see that at times Rebecca becomes the key character in this story. And in verses 14 through 17, we see a shift in subject, a shift in actor, and it's Rebecca who's making things happen. And this pulls us back then to our kind of Aramean characteristics. And we see within them um, a number of things coming together, perhaps a certain wiliness. When we saw Esau described, he's a hairy man, he's a hunter, he's an outdoorsman, he's comfortable, um, working with his hands and acting through physicality to get what he wants. But when we think of Jacob, we think of a kind of a slippery figure in every sense of the word. So he is someone who is not hairy, not easy to kind of get a hold of. But he's also someone who survives through his tongue at times, who is willing to be deceptive who is willing to say and do what's needed for survival. And this very much happens then as Jacob and Rebecca get the blessing that is really the birthright of Esau. So once again, they prepare a meal for um, Isaac and convince Isaac that this is Esau's meal, this is Esau's gift to him, and ultimately, this is the time for Isaac to, the elderly Isaac, to give this blessing to Esau. So they fool, um, they fool Isaac, and Isaac gives that blessing then to Jacob instead of Esau. After the blessing happens, we see one of the great defining characteristics of this story. Esau has a justified rage. He has been robbed of what is his, of what is owed to him, and this rage turns into greater and greater hatred. Rebecca, realizing the danger that her second-born son is in, warns 
Jacob that now he must flee. And so this story is very much a story of flight and return. This is a, we'll find many stories like this in the Old Testament, but this is probably the first place where it begins. So we have elements that connect this story to other stories before in the Old Testament. So we have this strong emphasis or theme of sibling rivalry, which we've already seen in the Cain and Abel story. Um, now we see that sibling rivalry story emerge once again here in this story between Esau and Jacob. But now there's a new layer of flight, of escape, and needing to get, get away. And this seems to be a very important element because now Jacob is really on the run for his life. And Jacob will now start to become a new person as all that he owns, as all that he treasures is left behind. And so perhaps in a way somewhat parallel to Abraham, we see that Jacob is forced to grow as a person as he leaves his father's house, as he leaves his father's country and must move to a new place. We see the first growth happen in chapter 28 and with the somewhat mysterious story and at Bethel. And this is a famous story of the so-called stairway to heaven. But in some respects, it's really not a stairway. I think, and I've heard it characterized better as maybe a fire pole to heaven. And like a fire pole in a fire station, one does not go up and down that. Simply God's messengers come down that fire pole, but humans can't easily go up that fire pole. And so this seems to be then a place where Jacob, perhaps for the first time in his life, really finds God and sees the importance of God within his life. And so after this dream episode, another important characteristic of these Jacob stories, the importance of dreams, we see that Jacob starts to change. Jacob starts to develop. He gets up in the morning and he tries to find ways to sanctify this land, ultimately kind of anointing a rock and then therefore anointing a place. And this becomes one of our and the first great places in the Bible. And Bethel is after Jerusalem, probably the most important sanctuary in the Holy Land. Only Jerusalem is mentioned more times than any other city than Bethel. And, and Bethel would only be perhaps 20 or 30 miles from Jerusalem to the north. So now we have a new sacred place, a new place where God is found and is special for the people. And this is no accident that it's north of Jerusalem and north of, more so north of Hebron and Beersheba with which we identify Abraham and Isaac. Because Jacob is very much going to be associated with the north of Israel and the 10 tribes that ultimately settle in the north of Israel and the kingdom of Israel as opposed to the kingdom of Judah are all associated with Jacob, whose name of course turns to Israel. So we have this place north of Jerusalem as significant and we'll later see places west of, um, of the Jordan becoming significant as well for Jacob as he becomes associated more and more with the west and the north rather than the south. So this is a result of this dream in chapter 28. And then he moves on to another significant cycle of stories and kind of a story within a story and here. And that is his meeting with Laban and Rebecca's brother, whom he is sent to um, spend time with as he escapes. Now his meeting with Laban is um, in some respects somewhat comical and we see the tricky Jacob being outflanked repeatedly by Laban who is even more tricky. And now we're up in Haran, a 
probable Aramean city of Mesopotamia. And, and so all these characteristics that Rebecca has, Laban has seemingly even more so. And in some respects, Laban sets out to um, kind of undo all the blessings and all the good fortune that Rebecca brought into his life. So what the sister gives, the brother takes. Um, and yet, it's not complete and it really seems to serve as um, a set of challenges and a set of tests that Jacob ultimately will be able to, um, will be able to um, overcome. Overcome, that is, with the help of the God of Jacob, Yahweh, the God of the weak and the poor. So we see then that Jacob um, comes into um, Laban's family and Laban's people and almost instantly we see a new development in the character of Jacob. Jacob meets, um, before he gets to Laban, he meets Rachel. Um, Rachel will be the great love of Jacob's life. Um, he will work 14 years just to be able to marry Rachel. And the difficulties in this are um, hinted at almost at the beginning. Like many other great biblical figures, Jacob meets Rachel at a well. We'll see Moses doing this. And ultimately in the New Testament, we'll see Christ having significant conversations with women at the well. These are heavily loaded areas. Jacob can't initially and easily move the, co the cover of the wellstone, hinting at the difficulties in procuring the hand of Rachel. And we find something in this story, I believe it's verse 11, that we find nowhere else in the Old Testament. Jacob kisses Rachel. And with this kiss, we see a new development in Jacob. He seems to become a little more vulnerable. So this character that we saw who has been struggling and fighting and constantly and before now is growing. We've seen this growth and this recognition of God and a role of God in his life in chapter 28. Now we see this growth in relationship, in the role of women, in the role of love in his life. But this will not be easy. And so Laban um, produces the irony that in some respects is so richly deserved by Jacob. We find that Jacob, after seven years, is ready to marry Rachel and on his wedding night and everything goes according to plan. But the next morning, to Jacob's consternation, he wakes up next to Leah. Leah is the firstborn. And this birthright that Jacob has stolen has now in some ways been repaid to him because he must spend time with the firstborn. As Laban explains, the customs of our people here is that the firstborn daughter must be married before the second da born daughter is married. So therefore we find Jacob work another seven years in order to gain the hand of Rachel. In this time, we see that Rachel ends up having important characteristics that connect her to other biblical women whom we hold dear. Initially, we know that Rachel has some difficulty in giving birth to children. This we saw with Sarah, and in some respects, this introduction to Sarah in Genesis 11 to 30 characterized the kind of narrative arc of the Abram cycle. This was also a problem with Rebecca. It was a problem that was quickly resolved, but prayer was needed, and Isaac was faithful in prayer in order for Rebecca to overcome her barrenness. And this is a problem with, excuse me, and this is a problem with Rachel. And so Leah produces many children. Ultimately, Rachel uses one of her handmaids, Bilha, to try to produce surrogate children. Leah comes back and she's able to get one of her handmaids, Zilpa, and she produces surrogate children. And then finally, and perhaps most importantly, in the in the movement of this story, 
Rachel is able to produce a child. God blesses Rachel with Joseph, another very important figure. And with this blessing of Joseph, now we've kind of, in many respects, reached the, the turning point of this story. And this Jacob cycle, I think more so than the Abraham cycle, really kind of comes to a crescendo right in the middle of the story. There's what we refer to in biblical studies as a chiastic structure, kind of like an X and cut off in the middle. We move to the center and then we go back out. But with Joseph, we find the savior of Israel. And we'll have to go on to read and study that story to see how that happens. But with the savior of Israel born, now Jacob wants to return to the promised land and makes that move to return to the promised land. So Rachel and Leah, their handmaids, and Jacob all start to return to the promised land. Now Laban shows his wiliness once again, and he's had 14 good years of working with Jacob. In many respects, that blessing that Jacob stole um, in chapter 27 has produced and found a chief beneficiary in, in um, the figure of Laban as he has prospered through all Jacob's hard work. And finally, we find God coming back into this story as Jacob tries to find ways out of this. He keeps on getting turned aside from Laban, keeps on finding struggles and challenges. But ultimately, God, that defender of the poor, that God who heard the cry of the baby Ishmael, that God who came to the to help Hagar comes to help Jacob in his hour of need and helps him get back to the promised land. This is not without difficulties as Laban pursues him. And so we end up once again with Jacob in flight. And we see how flight is a very important characteristic of this story. First he's fleeing from Esau, now he's fleeing from, from Jacob. And like this flight, from Esau, we find another important dream sequence as Jacob makes it back to the western, excuse me, to the eastern part of the Holy Land, to the area called Machainam. We see that he sets up camp there. He has a significant dream. He has a sense of God being with him. And as we said that Abraham was attracted and seemed to set either plant or notice trees all throughout the Holy Land, we find that Jacob has a similar type of icon or something associated with him. The Hebrew word for this is masaba, a word that's translated in three or four different ways throughout this story, but is mentioned 11 times. And a masaba is perhaps, when one sees it in the field, it can be almost like a five foot tall gravestone, and a lot of times it will be inscribed, and it's used by many of the different peoples throughout the ancient Near East. And Jacob sets up these masaba to connote important places to him. So he sets one up at Bethel, where that was very important, and he'll go back and set up another at Bethel. He'll set up one during these stories in chapter 31, where he has a significant dream. From there, we see another very important episode in Jacob's life. So as he is in this, what we technically refer to as a liminal zone, a place in between, in some respects crossing a threshold, he encounters another strange figure with whom he wrestles. And so Jacob has been wrestling all his life. He was wrestling his brother in the womb he has been struggling to get his brother's birthright, to get his father's blessing. He's been struggling repeatedly with Laban. And now he's struggling once again with this mysterious figure at the river Jabbok. And they struggle all night long. And ultimately, um, we can say 
that Jacob survives. I'm not sure we can say too much more than that, and much has been said about this story, but I think the important element is Jacob's survival. And so with this survival, he is also marked though, and once again, he becomes even more vulnerable. So his first meeting with God gave him some direction and recognition of God's role in his life. His first meeting with Rachel made him more vulnerable through love, and we see him working and slaving away for many years out of love. Now, once again, he leaves this mysterious wrestling match with a limp and is even more vulnerable, more dependent on those around him. And it's very significant here because now Jacob is moving in the direction of reconciliation. He knows that in order to live back in the promised land where he wants to be, he must make peace with his brother Esau. And so he now must limp to see Esau. As they limp and they meet, Esau is no longer full of burning rage. Instead, he's full of, I think, a burning passion for reconciliation with his brother. There is many tears shed in their meeting, and they are able to reconcile and live next to each other. And Esau, ultimately in the kingdom of Edom, Jacob, ultimately in Israel. And it's at this point that there is a change of name. Before Jacob goes to meet with Esau, he is renamed Israel. And this is a, a very significant patch where he's crossed a threshold. He's left the identity of Jacob now behind him, and he has moved on to the identity of Israel. And so as we understand that identity of Israel, we can see the meaning of Jacob's name in that, he who has struggled. And so we see that struggle. We see that early in the story, Jacob has taken. And we remember how in other stories, how the Nephilim have taken. And we can see that that taking is not a good verb. It's not something that's positive. But now we see Jacob restoring. And so he's restored right relationship with his brother Esau. And therefore we see these values that we've associated with Abraham, this value of shalom, peace, this value of sadaqah, justice, now becoming values within Jacob's life. And so now that he has peace and justice with Esau, he goes and moves into the promised land. In the promised land, we see struggles, many struggles. And as they try to, Jacob and his sons try to find their way in there. Ultimately, one of Jacob's daughters, and Dina, is raped by the Shechemites. And the brothers burn with vengeance against the Shechemites. We find that Jacob here is a figure of reconciliation. He's not able to control his sons, and we see a great massacre result as, happen as a result of this rape, where Jacob's sons massacre many of the Shechemites. But at the same time, we see Jacob as a force for Shalom, as someone now concerned with getting along with the people of the Promised Land, not fleeing them. So the story has come full circle, and we see that, as with any flight, there is, at the end of it, a hope for return. And that's exactly what we find with Jacob. He has been able to find justice and peace in his return to the Holy Land. He has developed as a person, rather than being someone who is struggling and seems to have no place for God in their life, now he is someone who has found God and is becoming a zealous religious leader. So in chapter 35, and towards the end of this, we'll see Jacob return to Bethel. And at Bethel, that place where he first found that stairway to heaven or that fire pole to heaven, whatever way we want to understand that, he is now a zealous religious leader wanting to make this place sacred, wanting to share this place with other Israelites. And we see the change in his character. We see how love has changed him, how his struggles 
um, have changed him. He's become more vulnerable and he has found a way to become a true leader of the people of Israel. This then calls to mind questions um, for us and we must think about why did Jacob's name change? We must think about um, how has Jacob grown in the course of this cycle and we must think a little bit also about how the characters of Jacob and Esau, perhaps Rebecca and Laban, are something more than simply individuals, but people that recall a collective memory, people that recall a collective people.